Hello, everyone. Welcome to Book Talk Nation. We are now broadcasting live. Tonight's chat is with Susan Elliott Neal. Um, if you haven't joined a Book Talk Nation chat before, uh, this works a little bit like an author event in a bookstore. So Susan's going to talk about her new book, The Prime Minister's Secret Agent. Um, if you haven't ordered that book, you can do so right here at BookTalkNation.com, and she'll be signing and personalizing all of those copies. Uh, now, if you'd like to sign and personalize copy, you'll want to make sure that you get that order in by tomorrow night at midnight. That's when the sales will close. And then Word, local independent bookstore in Brooklyn, will uh, ship those, those books right to your door. In about 20 minutes, Susan's going to answer your questions live. Um, you submitted questions ahead of time when you RSVP, RSVP'd for the event. And then you'll also see that there's a chat box underneath this video window. You can use that to submit live questions for Susan, and she'll answer those as well. Until then, I'm going to turn it over to our interviewer tonight, who is Hank Phillippe Ryan. She's the on-air investigative reporter for Boston's NBC affiliate. She's won 32 Emmys, 12 Edward R. Murrow Awards, and dozens of other honors for her groundbreaking journalism. So a big welcome to Hank and to Susan. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I promise not to ask you really difficult questions, Susan. This is not an investigative reportery kind of thing. <laughs> Susan and I are great pals. I'm a mystery thriller author also. And Susan and I are sisters on the Jungle Red blog. So we talk together uh, every day. So I'm so thrilled to be here talking with her in sort of person. I'm in Boston. She's in New York. Um, and I keep thinking talking to you tonight about um, what your Winston Churchill says in your new book, I Must Have Hope. And that's what we're all thinking here tonight. It's so much fun to have a new Maggie Hope book to read. We must have hope, right, all of you? Um, Susan, when, where did Maggie Hope come from in your imagination? Where, do you remember when you first thought of her? I, I do. It was, it was an incredibly powerful experience. Um, I was in London with my husband who, um, you know, like here's the parenthetical quotes, by the way, is a Jim Henson Muppet. So he was over there for a show called Bear in the Big Blue House. And we were over for quite a while. And I remember going to a pub, and a friend gave me a copy of Time Out London. And he flipped to uh, the Churchill Cabinet War Room ad, and he said, you know, I'm not going to do an accent because I don't do accents. But <clears throat> he said in this beautiful British accent, you know, you might want to check out the war rooms despite what you Yanks might think World War II didn't start with Pearl Harbor. So I took that as the challenge, and I went to the war rooms, and it was way back, it was years and years ago, over a decade ago, before they were the big deal that they are now. And um, I went, and it was nearly empty. And I remember walking around. Um, the war rooms are the bunker underneath uh, Whitehall near 10 Downing Street, where Churchill and the other cabinet members basically ran the war with uh, bomb protection overhead. And I do remember walking those halls, the same halls that Winston Churchill walked. And it was such an intense and powerful experience for me for a moment. And I know this sounds completely insane, but there was a brief moment where I could sort of hear the telephones ringing and smell the cigar smoke. And I could feel that sort of fear and pressure and anxiety that they all must have been feeling. Um, and it was so powerful to me that I knew that I wanted to write a book about it. So that was the, that was 1999, and that was the beginning. It's so interesting, though, because where did Maggie come from? That I mean, how did you decide? How did you decide to write a mystery? How did you decide Maggie Hope? How did you decide not to do nonfiction? Where did that? I mean, I, I it's so fabulous to hear about that the the moment that you fell in love with the era. But when did you find Maggie, and how? Um, well, one of the lovely things about the museum is they have one of those um, audio uh, devices so you can listen to a narrative of what you're seeing. One of the readings, when you look at the room where the typists were, the, the secretaries, um, you get an audio of an actress reading from the memoirs of Mrs. Elizabeth Leighton Nell. Now, she was Mr. Churchill's secretary. So I had her words in my ear, and I could just picture them all so clearly, and I was just thinking, um, wouldn't, I, I, I don't know, I just thought it would be such a great place for a really smart woman to be sort of like, to pick up something in terms of codes and the war and be completely dismissed because, you know, she's in the typing pool. 
Um, so that's where that's where Maggie Hope came from. So did you? Uh, I mean, I love the name. I mean, the name can't be random. Did she spring fully formed with that name, or did you go through other names? It, it, no, um, there was a, another typist named Marion Holmes, and um, she also wrote a memoir, and I read that. And when she wrote um, about her first meeting with Churchill, he actually thought her name was Hope, Marion Hope. And he was actually quite disappointed when it wasn't, because I think he wanted a bit of hope in his office. Um, but then he called her, he started to call her Miss Sherlock, because, you know, that was just the kind of guy he was. Um, so Maggie is a variation of Marion, um, and Hope is what Mr. Churchill was looking for. And so it's a little homage to Marion Holmes. But it's lovely because that's what everybody in the war was looking for, and that is so, you know, that's such a theme of your books, the, the darkness and the light, the hope, the change, the evolution. Talk a little bit, I mean, you see that from the, in your new book, The Prime Minister's Secret Agent, that theme of hope, that theme of the darkness and the light, the theme of rebirth, the, the theme that you can come back of, you know, everything from the rhododendrons to the new baby. Um, how do you weave that? No, the rhododendrons. <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, one of the things that I wanted to do, you know, during the series, Maggie, you know, she starts off as a very um, naive, kind of know-it-all, almost uh, 25 year old, as you know, some of us were, <laughs> but she goes through so much and there's so much trauma and there was so much trauma in the third book when she goes to Berlin and one of the things I did not want to do was I did not want to have a sort of Daniel Craig and James Bond where you know you, you pick up the new book or you go to the new movie and everything sort of set back to where it was um, I really wanted to show that this cumulative effect of all the trauma and that that's natural, that happens, it, it's going to happen, and also the people make their way through trauma. I think that's also important to remember and think about. I mean, it's great because, you know, authors always talk about how a really good main character grows and changes, but what I love about how Maggie grows and changes, and everyone who's read the other, I mean, you don't have to read these books in order, you can read each one individually, and I want to talk about that too, but even the people who are starting with this book, and it's easy to do so, will see that Maggie herself realizes that she's, she says, she's, I'm no longer the plucky ingenue. She understands that there's something that's changed in her soul and her heart. But to write that, how did it feel to write that, to, to be in Maggie's change? You know, it felt really good. Um, I think there's a... I don't know, there are some, there are just some characters that stay very static, and I think readers like that in some ways because then they, they know what kind of experience they're going to get when they pick up a book. But I just felt like with war and the trauma, this was as much about the story of a young woman growing up and finding her adult self as anything else um, to do with the war. Um, I think we all have our traumas, perhaps not you know, as dramatic as Maggie's, but we all have our traumas that force us into growing up. We all have our setbacks. And um, <clears throat> it, was, it was really great for me to explore that. I, I mean, it, it was very healing, I think, to me to explore that. Well, let's talk about the book a little bit. The Prime Minister's Secret Agent begins just before Pearl Harbor, although, of course, Maggie doesn't know that, and nobody really knows that. Nobody knows. Um, talk a little bit about the elements of the book and what you put together for that. Well, the book is, has a multiple um, points of view. One is a, a point of view from Washington and basically everything leading up to Pearl Harbor, and one of the things that I wanted to do with that was to show... Um, you know, it was, it was Maggie's darkest hour, really, um, just in terms of her trauma and her depression. And also, it was Britain's darkest hour. We always, as Americans, we think of December as, like, the lead-up to Pearl Harbor and then Pearl Harbor and the aftermath. But truly, that fall and winter was so horrific for the British. And there was no sense that President Roosevelt was going to join the war anytime soon. So I really wanted to show that um, Maggie's story was parallel to Britain's story, and that um, you know there there was there was a relation, and they both sort of got through what they needed to get through, and they they both got sort of back on track. Well, starting from the very beginning, Maggie Hope is a young, smart, brilliant woman from the United States who comes 
to England under various circumstances. And she and in the first book she becomes a code breaker. And mm -hmm. then she becomes more um, involved in the British war effort with Winston Churchill, with um, Bletchley Park. And in this book, tell us about where Maggie is. Well, she's taking a bit of a break, actually. They, they don't really feel great about her going back behind enemy lines with her current mental situation. So basically, she goes back to her old training camp uh, for secret agents and spies, which was uh, in Airsig, Scotland, on the western coast. And this was a real training camp. And actually, I went there um, to do research, which was, like, amazing. OK, so tell us about that in a second. But go on with what Maggie does. I do want to hear about your research. Oh, well, so basically she's there um, basically trying to get her act together after all these horrific things, and she she's had, to, she's had to kill someone, she watched someone die. It's, she's she been killed someone, someone and is dealing with the moral sort of blowback of, of actually taking a human life. Um, but she has a friend, um, Sarah, who was in uh, Mr. Churchill's secretary, and Sarah's a ballet dancer, and she's performing in Edinburgh. As the Vic, the Vic Wells is the precursor to the Royal Ballet, and they did tour to uh, boost morale. Um, so when she goes to visit Sarah, and basically one of her um, mentors makes her because he thinks she's just too depressed and just hanging around and not, you know, doing anything. So when she goes there, there's a murder, of course, um, and. Not only does she have to help her friend, um, you know, she needs to solve this murder, and it gives her. And, and I think again, that's where it sort of parallels, you know, all of us with our real lives. I think you know sometimes we can go to these dark places, but really the answer is in helping people and getting out of ourselves and and you know becoming active in the world and. By doing that, by helping uh, her friend Sarah and by solving this mystery, she actually kind of heals herself and, you know, is, is able to go on from there. Gives herself hope. Yes, indeed. But, so, you know what, you just, you, your, your research is so phenomenal. And it's not only that the research is phenomenal, but you have this amazing skill in being able to take an incredible amount of research and somehow process it through your brain and come out with, fiction with a story that makes us feel that Maggie is not only a witness to the war, but actually played a role in the war. How does your brain work? How do you do that? <laughs> oh, Hank. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. I, I guess I would just, I just think of what it must have been like to be a, a really smart woman who would like to do more, who would actually like to be in, in battle. Um, in this horrific time, and what what she would be doing to um, assuage her own conscience that she could she's doing everything she can for the war effort, and for her, because she is so smart and because she does have this very special skill set, it it's more than just you know working in the factories. So yeah, but see, listen, you know, in reading the book. You can smell it, you can taste it, you can read the advertisements, you know what the buildings look like, you know what the food and the restaurants and how people talked. You know, this is, I mean, someone who get, has research, it, it's dry and it's history, in the driest of history ways. You make history into a story. And I'm always fascinated by how, by your imagination and um, how thoughtfully and seamlessly you weave that research into your books. You know, it, it's just very vivid to me. It, it just, um, I feel like um, it's not long ago and far away, and it's not dusty history. I feel like it's very live and present and important. Um, and I'm glad it comes across that way on the page. I, I truly am. I'm trying to envision you in your wherever you write. Do you write at a computer and in an office, and do you come with stacks of index cards? I mean, the, in the end of your of this book, the Prime Minister's Secret Agent, there are pages and pages of the books that you used for research. Do you have cards, or how do you organize yourself, and how do you feel when you sit down to write, and do you know what's going to happen at the end? Tell us about you writing. Oh, well, first of all, you know, I live in New York City, so we have a New York City-sized apartment, and there are so many books. I can't even tell. I'm looking, I'm looking at all of our crazy bookshelves right now. It is in very, very incredible how many books we have. Um, I like using those little sticky notes, you know, those little, like, I, I like hot pink because 
you know, I like hot pink. And I, I st I, when I first read through a book, I'll sticky note all the things that I'm really interested in. And um, then usually what I do is I break down the story. I outline the story, and then I break down the different plots, like the A, B, C plots. And I tend to write them all in one go. So I'll go. I'll do like the C plot. So say, um, so for this book, it would have been say Clara, um, Maggie's mother in the Tower of London, and I would have basically written that from beginning to end, oh and then I would have written another subplot from beginning to end, and then another, and then you know I sort of spliced them together. So. That is the most interesting thing I've ever heard. I have never heard of another author who writes that way. It is it's really? complete, no, never, never. That's completely fascinating. And so do you know how each of those plots is going to end? And do you know how they're all going to come together in the end? I have an idea. I have an outline. But things are always changing. And sometimes I'm surprised. In fact, I'm writing. I just finished one of the subplots for the next book. Um, and one of the characters, I won't say who, but did something so very surprising to me, and that's how the, that that subplot ended. And it wasn't; it was so, so going to be something else that was really surprising, but I had it planned. It was like in my back pocket. No, she decided to do something else completely different. So they just, yeah, they do. Feel, they, how does that feel to you when that happens? When that is the best. That's the best feeling ever when they start acting on their own and I'm not guiding them. That's I mean, Hugh Grafton calls that the magic, and you can't make it happen. No. But, yeah. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, you sit down at your desk, at your desk, right, at a computer, not knowing what's going to happen that day. Sometimes I, I mean I have I have an idea in my head. So like one character is say going to meet another character that becomes important, say, and I've got, you know, a location, I've got a time of day, I've got a date. Um, I know who the people involved are. But then it's really just like, well, how would they meet? And maybe, you know, like I have a character who who is very tall and lanky and he has very long legs and maybe they're stretched out in a hotel lobby and Maybe a certain young woman will trip over his legs, and then they start talking. So, did you always want to be a writer when you were little? Did you think, oh, this is what I'd like to be a mystery author? Did you think I'd like to be a New York Times best-selling author the way you are? I, I never thought about that at all. I was a voracious, voracious reader, though. Um, the library was my home away from home. Um, I loved books so much. Um, I can't even imagine a, a world without books. I was one of those real book nerd kids. And I don't know. I mean, I think at some point I wanted to write. Um, and I wrote, I, I was an English major. And um, I worked in book publishing and in journalism. Um, sorry, this is my phone. We're having an emergency alert for flash floods. Your life is so exciting at every minute something is happening to you. You know, I know Susan that you're going to use this in your next book, right? <laughs> She's in the, he's in the middle of something and suddenly the alarms, well they do, they do anyway. You know, they wind up having dinner and they wind up in the um, in the cellar in the bomb shelters and they never know what that is going to happen. So your life is imitating your art, I think. Um, so where were we now? I, uh, we completely lost track of this of this entire <laughs> thing. Um, uh, no, no, no. So, I, this, go is, ahead. this is the problem with the Skype thing. We're now talking over each other. Thank you so much. Um, you're talking about met, how you come up with things and Sue Grafton's magic and how the story just evolves and what you wanted to be when you were growing up. Do you remember when you typed the beginning of the first Maggie Hope? Do you remember when you started writing that? And oh, I do. Um, I, it was uh, 1999. It was not long after that trip to the cabinet war rooms, although I spent a lot of time doing research. I knew really very little about Britain in World War II, especially World War II before the Americans joined in. I mean, I think I'm a typical American in that way. Um, and I do remember it was in first person, not third person the way it is now. It was um, much sort of smaller, softer, um, 
tinier um, book when I first started it. So, um, yeah, that's so fascinating. And then it evolved in, into what it is now. You know, you have me thinking about series. You know, this book that started out as this little tiny book has burgeoned into um, a, 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 an incredibly successful series with an icon, already iconic character. And one of the things you have to juggle in writing a series is making sure that each book is a satisfying whole in itself, but leaves some tantalizing um, ends to have the next to, to come up, to come off in the next book. How much do you keep that in mind? How much are you juggling these lives and making sure um, that your readers are reassured that they'll have more to come? Or not? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Um, sometimes, uh, actually, often when I'm writing, now that I know um, that I have more books that I get to do, um, I keep sort of a running journal of ideas for the, the books coming up. And there are a lot of things, like, you know, when I was writing the third book, His Majesty's Hope, when Maggie was in Berlin, for example, um, she was going through so much. And the thing is, she never had time to process any of it. And I knew in book four, I wanted the, the Prime Minister's secret agent, I wanted to bring her somewhere where she could decompress and kind of deal with all of these traumas that she's experienced. So it's funny writing that book, The Prime Minister's Secret Agent, which is a bit darker. Um, I knew that for the book after that, and I knew um, timing-wise it would be Churchill going to the United States and meeting with President Roosevelt and the First Lady. Um, and of course I wanted Maggie to be there too. But in a way, you know, she's, she's healed. Um, the United States has joined with Britain against the Axis. Um, they're going to the United States where there's no rationing, no one's bombing them. Um, it's a pretty great situation. After living in um, Britain for so long, it's a pretty great situation to be there, you know, be somewhere like that. So it's, it's I knew tone-wise I wanted to do, uh, go back to a, a bit of a lighter book, as light as you can get during World War II. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and so, but if the tantalizing, the, the tantalizing two, last two pages, are the, well, you know what, let me ask you something else. One of the things that you do, and I think it's so brave, is that you take history and propose that some of it might have happened another way, and then come out on the other end with reality. Um, you know what I mean, because I don't want to do any spoilers, but yeah. um, is that, you know, you're taking control of a story that people kind of already know or we think we know, and you make it be new. Well, history, you know, Churchill said, uh, history will treat me kindly because I shall write it myself. Um, you know, our version of history is very, um, you know, it's slanted. It's, uh, it's a slippery thing. And we get history from a certain point of view. We get history from a certain group of people. Um, and there's always another side to a story. And I like taking the idea of looking at sides we don't usually think of. You know, so for Mr. Churchill's secretary, I was like thinking about the IRA. And for um, Princess Elizabeth Spy, for example, it was thinking about Wallace Simpson and the Duke of Windsor and what, you know, all of those sort of pro-Nazi British, um, British establishment that did exist and was actually not, they weren't really happy that, you know, there was a, a war going on because why didn't they just work with Germany? Um, so there are other stories. They tend to get cleaned up, I think. In, uh, and that's, I mean, so fascinating because I thought I knew everything, you know, from my own cursory education of, of what happened at this time during the war. And you bring up so many tantalizing questions about what might have been and how the decisions got made and how the dominoes fell. Um, and I and I love you getting inside. I mean, that's pretty that's pretty nervy getting inside Winston Churchill's head. How did you feel? I, that was you? scary. I actually, yeah, that was um, that was quite a challenge. But I felt like I needed to do it. Um, I'm not going to give away the spoiler, but there's a situation with Winston Churchill, and I really feel from everything I know about Bletchley Park and the information that the British were getting, I think Winston Churchill would have had a certain piece of information. And also, even if he didn't, I feel that 
his character, um, he was so determined to see Britain through the war and to have Britain survive that he would have done anything, anything in his power to, to make sure that, that, that Britain survived. So, yes, I kind of took some liberties. Um, what I try to do is just remind people at the end that it is fiction. It's a novel. And, you know, I list all my sources, as you mentioned, so they can go back and look for themselves and decide for themselves what they think and all that stuff. Yeah, well, it's fascinating. It's haunting me. I know we want to take some uh, viewer questions. Shall we do that? That would be great. Excellent. So, um, it is that time to do some of the audience questions, some of the reader questions. Um, some of these are questions that you submitted ahead of time when you RSVP'd for the event. Um, and then you can also submit a question live right now for Susan by using the chat box underneath this video window. So I will go ahead and jump to some of those questions for you. Um, While you're looking, I just want to say, Susan, you're so fabulous. This is I have 10,000 more questions for you. But your <laughs> book you is... You are so sweet. sweet. I think we should go on tour together. I'm with you. Definitely yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. This says, I absolutely love the Maggie Hope series and think you do an excellent job of bringing to life these locations and characters that feel very real and authentic to the time. How do you do that? Are you able to travel, travel to the locations to get a better feel for them? I know you touched on that a little bit. I, as much as possible, no, it's a good question, though. As much as possible, I, I really try to travel and really go to the actual places um, my husband's read drafts of the book before, you know, the various books before I've gone on the trips and then after I've gone on the trips, and he says, you know, it's just a whole different kind of book post-trip. So um, I think all of that is worth it. I mean, believe me, it is, it is hard to get to Erisig, Scotland. I went um, in January when, you know, I was the only person there. It was like The Shining, except in a good way. It was in a good way. But, you know, it it, it, um, it, it makes it all come alive, and then I, I am so happy it came alive for a reader. That, that makes me feel wonderful. So thank you. Excellent. Excellent question. Um, and we will go to the next one here. Looks like Maggie will be in the U.S. for your next book, but are you planning to bring her back to the U.K. after that? Well, I haven't written the ending yet. <laughs> um, as far as I know, um, yes, she'll be coming back to the UK after after uh, Mrs. Roosevelt's confidant. Yes. Uh, let's see if we can fit a few more in here. Um, are you surprised how interested your readers are in the World War II period? And that's from Elaine Dale in Woodstock, Ontario. Oh. You know, yes, I am. I am really surprised. Um, we didn't go into this. Uh, Hank and I didn't go into this, but I had a really difficult time getting an agent, and then I had a really difficult time getting a publisher. It took a very, very long time. And one of the things that I kept hearing was um, women want to read uh, historical fiction set in the Tudor period, Elizabethan, Victorian, Regency, and that's it. Like nobody wants. Uh, the 20th century, no one wants World War II, no one wants women in war. Um, it's funny, I think, um, you know, the Maisie Dobbs series broke a lot of ground, and um, then, of course, Downton Abbey came along. Um, I was working on my stuff way before any of those came along, but I think it really helped in terms of making it sort of it more accessible. And then there is this interest, which I think is great. Um, so I'm, I'm always happy to... Um, Prove publishing people wrong. <laughs> um, from Megan, how many Maggie books do you plan to write? And she says, please say many more. Oh, I would love to write many more. Um, I'm under contract for two more. And there's still we're only in 1942, I think. So there's plenty of uh, warriors left. I was at uh, the Mysterious Bookshop in New York the other night when he asked that question. and. And somebody said, well, there's always the Cold War. So, you know, <laughs> Maggie can go on if there's interest and people want to hear about her adventures. I would dearly, dearly love that. I feel like I'm not done with this character. I, I love her, and I want to see her and her friends through this journey. Um, and the next question is from Daphne. Do you relate to Maggie? Do you feel like there is any of you in the character? 
You know, Maggie's a lot, first of all, she's a lot younger than I am, but she's also a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> um, I think we do have certain traits in common, though. We both have a sort of sarcastic sense of humor. Um, you know, luckily, uh, Maggie's pretty discreet, and she only thinks, you know, she'll think a lot of things that she doesn't say, so that's good. So we both probably think a lot of things that we don't say. Um, let's see, we have another one popping in here. This is from Lisa. How did you decide to bring a cat into Maggie's life? <laughs> oh, Lisa, I love this question. Um, when I was Maggie's age, uh, I, I can't say I, you know, shot a Nazi in Berlin, but I did go through some sort of uh, challenging times, and this stray cat kind of found his way into my life, and uh, I really I don't borrow things directly from life very often. They're all, they're very disguised or you know combined and whatever. But um, Mr. K, Maggie's cat, and he will remain Maggie's cat, uh, is definitely based on a cat that I had when I was her age, and he helped me through a lot. Um, with that question, that brings us about the time to wrap up here. Um, I want to remind everyone who's joined us tonight that Susan is signing and personalizing copies of the Prime Minister's Secret Agent. In addition to that book, she also has Mr. Churchill's Secretary, His Majesty's Hope, and Princess Elizabeth's Spy. So all of those she'll be signing and personalizing. Um, they're available on BookTalkNation.com or right here on this video page. Um, until tomorrow night at midnight. So if you want that personalized and signed copy, you want to make sure you get your order in by then. And then Word, a local independent bookstore in Brooklyn, will ship those orders right to your door. So I want to thank everyone again for entering your great questions, um, for joining us tonight, and a very, very big thank you to Hank and Susan. It's been such a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you. This was great. It was fantastic, and everybody have a great night. <laughs>